Hello everyone and welcome to my complete Saviors of Uldoom set review uh, here at Omni Slash. I am of course Brian Kibler and I'm going to be talking about all of the cards from the new set, uh, which by the way is my absolute favorite set for a very long time. I'm super excited about a lot of the stuff in this set. Probably as excited as I've been since like Knights of the Frozen Throne in terms of just like cool exciting stuff that I really am interested in building decks around. And, uh, you know, I want to, uh, to dive right in. So let's get things started with Druid. So our very first card is Anubisath Defender. This, I think, is a pretty powerful card. It's obviously reminiscent of Arcane Tyrant, uh, which was a very strong card in the Ultimate Infestation builds of Druid you know, way back when. Infestation isn't around anymore, but there's still Nourish, which plays very well with the new Druid quest. Uh, along with lots of other strong things like, uh, you know, if you are playing the, uh, the Druid Quest Starfall, you can play, you know, a deck that uses this with Starfire. Um, can go very well with the uh, uh, the already existing um, Battlecry DL3, I think it's what, was it Skybound War Mage or something like that? Uh, in like a deck that cares about having big spells. So, uh, overall I think this is a very strong card, can give you board presence in a turn that you're otherwise playing removal, or developing mana, drawing cards, or something like, say, Nourish. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of play in a variety of different Druid decks. So uh, I think this is you know, one of the, the uh, you know, quietly very powerful Druid cards in the expansion. Next up we have Bees, which has to be said that way every time you say the card name. Uh, I think Bees is a really exciting card, not only because it uh, you know, gives you just some relatively flexible sort of like removal for druid you know if, if, for instance if your opponent has a small minion you could play your bees kill it with like one bee or two bees uh, and then sa still have some bees left over you know works in maybe like a removal spell and kind of a token style strategy for small minions that leave something behind bees is also really interesting because you you can use it on your own minions there's some weird uh, corner case stuff like using line breaker or gurubashi berserker and you know, make them just absolutely enormous and just kill your opponent in a single attack um, also works very well with things like Cult Master, or if there's like a new Corridor Creeper style card. Um, you know, just a lot of ways that this can be, you know, pretty powerful in uh, in sort of interesting and obscure ways that something like Shadow Bolt, which is obviously pretty reminiscent of, you know, if you just look at, oh, it's three mana, four damage. Um, but this has a lot more possible applications that I think, you know, will only grow as time goes on. So I think this is a really interesting card um, that's likely to see quite a bit of play. Next up we have Crystal Merchant. Uh, now Crystal Merchant is uh, obviously a card that leans toward seeing play in the, uh, the Quest Druid deck. We'll get to the Quest itself pretty soon. Uh, kind of reminiscent of Soup Vendor. I actually liked playing uh, quite a bit with Soup Vendor. I think that it's a, a pretty sweet card. Um, just giving you a little bit of extra card draw. This obviously has a slightly different conditional, uh, but a 2-4-4, four, four, or rather a 1-4-2, a four, four, um, with the ability to you know, continually give you some sort of flow of cards. You can basically can be guaranteed to get the, uh, the card draw the turn that you play it, and then if your opponent you know, doesn't kill it, maybe you have the opportunity to get more. Um, overall, you know, a lot of the time, uh, you know, a deck that is looking to, to be pl doing these sort of unspent mana, uh, you know, a Syrian tier thing, um, is going to have sort of interesting curve decisions to make over time. Uh, and, you know, this is kind of like, you know, like Mana Tide Totem, right? You, you play this with three mana, let's say, leaving one up, draw your card, and you're going to deal with the 1-4. So, you know, that's a pretty powerful sort of uh, card draw tool that you have access to. Uh, and I, I think that this will be a definitely see play in the sort of quest druid decks Probably not so much elsewhere most of the time when you're playing other styles of decks You know you you care about using your mana efficiently But you know maybe you're playing like a mid-range aggro ish token ish type of druid deck and you're like you know what? You know this is a, a decent body, you know t t not that easy to kill that you can buff um, That can you know give you a little bit extra card flow as long as you just play slightly inefficiently my guess is that it probably mostly sits in uh, in the uh, the quest druid decks, but I do expect those to be relatively strong, and this to be a strong component of them. Next up, we have uh, Elise the Enlightened. All the previous iterations of Elise have been among my favorite cards in Hearthstone of all time. Um, this one, I'm not I'm not totally sure on yet, but a I love the the sort of Rena mechanic, the no duplicate mechanic. I love building decks surrounding that. And I also love value. I'm, I'm the sort of person who, you know, really likes to play a game 
where I do all these fidgety things that, you know, give me like a bunch of extra resources that I get to use in cool ways. And this does all of that, right? Like this gives you the ability to, you know, play like a weird game depending on what cards you're able to duplicate. Like, oh, do you get, you know, an extra copy of, you know, your, I don't know, Alex Straza, your Scenarius, your, uh, Undasta. You like get to put Undasta into play off of your Undasta, get like a bunch of things into play because you got, you know, we were able to copy it with Elise. Whatever, just tons of crazy things. There's also, uh, you know, the actual ability to do like a, a one turn kill with Elise plus like Floop and like Floop's glorious gloop and like Moonfires or Claws or something. If you actually just have every single correct piece, you're able to, you know, go off with bees. This is another crazy bees thing. Like floops, glorious gloop plus bees, bees killing your floop, just making this cycle of generating additional uh, uh, additional uh, mana off of your floops, glorious gloop, and keep elising your floop and flooping your elise and getting you know, multiple copies of, of everything and going nuts. But that's not how I want to use this card. I want to use this card to just do even more of the cool things your deck can do by duplicating them. And uh, I'll definitely try, you know, the Singleton Druid deck. I think that there's tons of, of sweet opportunities to do awesome things. And, uh, you know, I, I doubt this is gonna be as sort of high impact as some of the other stuff going on, like the Druid Quest itself, I think is probably overall a stronger direction, it feels like, than the Singleton Druid to me. But uh, this can definitely create some awesome games and I'm looking forward to playing them. All right, next up we have Garden Gnome. Uh, this is a 4 cost 2-3. If you're holding a spell that costs 5 or more, summon 2-2-2 two, two, two Treants. So, much like the uh, Sky Reaver War Mage, which it's not Skybound War Mage, I think it's Sky Reaver War Mage, whatever it is, that War Mage fellow, also, this deck, this card goes in the same deck. You want to play a deck with a bunch of big spells, and you get big payoff, right? You get the, the War Mage, you get this, you get the uh, the free Senjin when you do play those spells. Um, so I, I think this is just a, a very, very um, strong card overall. You know, you look at this, turn four, you don't have to, have to have actually done anything before this point. You just have to have a spell that costs five or more. And you get a two, three, and two, two, twos. That's very, very strong board presence generation. And obviously Druid is a class that has a lot of ways to buff boards, take advantage of large boards. Um, you know, very strong overall. So I, I feel like this sort of Druid play big spells deck has a lot of tools. And, and frankly, you know, maybe that's a singleton deck too. Maybe you're, you know, playing your, your release and you're duplicating these and you're getting, you know, a, a lot of uh, extra value that way. Um, but I think that just building a straightforward, like I'm going to play big spells and, and have the, the synergistic cards um, like this and the, uh, the Anubis F Defender as well as the War Mage, you know, just a lot of ways to take advantage of that and, uh, you know, go big and, you know, get big board presence very early in the game. So I think this is a very strong card uh, and I expect to see a lot of it. Next up we have Hidden Oasis, a six cost spell. Choose one, uh, summon a six six ancient with taunt or restore 12 health. Obviously this is a, uh, a very strong card in uh, Quest Druid. You get both halves of this, this is a six six for six that draws, or draws 12. Doesn't draw 12, gains 12. <laughs> kind of like a, you know, mega ancient of lore without the card draw mode associated to, uh, with it. This is obviously also a five plus cost spell to go with Garden Gnome, to go with War Mage. Uh, to go with the Anubisat Defender. Um, so, you know, a lot of other sort of synergies going on, kind of like, like a lot of parts of the Buffalo, as it were. Um, in like a, a Lucent Bark deck, obviously, you know, again, the ability to gain 12, uh, the, the you know, ability to make a, you know, 6-6 six, six taunt for six is not like bad, right? It's not amazing, you're not thrilled for that. Um, but obviously the flexibility is pretty huge. It also works very well with Keeper Staladris. Um, you know, if this were just a 6-6 six, six taunt for six or, or, you know, a big heal spell, not having that synergy, um, you know, would be a lot weaker. And the ability to not only get the sort of duplicate it, uh, if you are playing the uh, Assyrian tier quest deck, but as well as have, you know, extra copies of each of the modes available off of Keeper is just, you know, extra power this card gives. So a six for a six, six, again, is not bad. And six for 12 health, 12 is just a lot of health, right? Obviously this isn't the best healing spell we've ever seen, but the modality makes it, uh, a lot more powerful, and obviously the synergies that it has with those other druid cards um, really, I think, pushes it over the top, and I think this is quite strong. Next up, we have Oasis Surger. Um, speaking of cards that are really strong, uh, this card, alongside the quest, is incredibly powerful. You know, if you complete the, the druid quest, you're getting uh, a 5-5 five, five rush and a 5-5 five, five rush. <laughs> you don't have to choose, right? You get two 5-5 five, five rushes for five, 
And like that is extremely strong. Now, this is just a a card that is absolutely huge payoff for your uh, for your quest. And frankly, uh, this is one of the big reasons I think that that sometimes if you you are playing the quest, you want to uh, play it a little bit weirdly. Uh, like for instance, if you if you're playing uh, the quest, you have the coin. On turn one, playing the quest and then coining means you advance your quest one on turn one. And then if you advance it again on turns two, three, and four, that means by turn five, you actually have your quest complete and you can play Oasis Surger with both modes, which is extremely powerful at getting you back into a game where you may have fallen behind because you were underspending your mana on the early turns. Um, so I, I, I feel like this is one of the really big payoff cards uh, for playing uh, the Druid Quest that, you know, like five mana for 10, 10 worth of stats, granted split across the two bodies, um, is you know extremely strong combined with rush just really is able to to secure the board back for you and uh, you know possibly just like wipe out you know a giant or wipe out two medium sized things and leave bodies behind and or just you know go on the offensive two five fives for five against any you know, opponent who doesn't have a board really really powerful and I, uh, I expect this to be one of the real cornerstone cards of the uh, the quest druid deck. I don't know that it'll see much play outside of that. I think that without the uh, the quest, you know, this ends up being a little bit, you know, perhaps a little bit weak. You know, but but still, even even then, two three three rushers is not bad, right? A single five five rusher is is probably less impressive. Um, but you know, the the fail state for this is not embarrassing. You look at like Crystal Stag, right? Crystal Stag is a card that that people did a lot of work to try and like build a deck to support, and it's plus one plus one compared to one of the modes of this, you know, obviously to each body, and you know, that matters quite a bit, but still, that's that's really, you know, something to think about when you consider, you know, how bad not having this turned on is, um, which, you know, is obviously much weaker than if you do have both modes combined with the quest, uh, but not a disaster by any means. All right, next up we have Overflow, seven cost spell, restore five health to all characters, draw five cards. Um, this, is, this is no ultimate infestation, I'll tell you that much. Obviously, you know, five health, draw five, kind of gets you know you your, your brain in the same spot, but there's a big difference between restore five health to all characters and uh, draw five and do all of the things, right? Kill a guy, make a guy, gain armor, draw the cards. Uh, that said, you know, this is still pretty strong. You know, if you're looking for a you know, significant card draw, um, this is you know the, the best card draw option that is available in, in Druid now. Um, five's a lot of cards, obviously, right? Um, and if you are playing this in, you know, say the, the the big spell deck, right? You're playing, you can play this, and then also play Anubis Left Defender behind it. Uh, when you're drawing five cards, there's a pretty good chance that you you draw into one, even if you didn't have one already. Um, I, I don't think this is likely to be anything remotely close to like as meta game defining as Ultimate Infestation was. Um, but it is it is a powerful tool for like a ramp style slash big spell style druid deck. The fact that it, it does gain life also obviously helps a great deal toward mitigating the damage that you're taking by you know playing a, a seven cost spell that does, doesn't actually impact the board immediately. Um, and then again, on top of that, the fact that you can you can play out the defenders in the same turn that you do draw off of this or have in your hand uh, beforehand. Uh, it, you know, it's the fact that it triggers uh, uh, the heal on everything. If there are multiple damage things, maybe you have, you know, you're actually playing Heal Druid. Maybe you have the, uh, what's it, Life Weaver. You know, you get a bunch of extra cards on top of the extra cards you have from this. Maybe a little too much. Um, but, you know, my, my feeling is this is like kind of a medium card. I doubt we'll see a ton of it. Um, but I could easily see this like a one of in, uh, in some sort of bigger Druid decks. Not a card you build your deck around, really. Um, but a, a utility uh, effect that you have if you're looking for a big card draw uh, tool. All right, next up we have one of the cards I was talking uh, about through many of those uh, previous cards, which is Untapped Potential. Quest, end four turns with any unspent mana, reward Assyrian Tear. Assyrian Tear is, bing, a passive hero power. Your choose one cards have both effects combined. I've talked about this a great deal um, in a number of the other card reviews already. I think this is quite powerful. Um, it's an extremely easy quest to turn on. Obviously, like you can just turn it on by turn five if you have uh, if you have the coin. Turn six if you don't, because you just play at turn one, underspend for you know for the four turns, and uh, and go. There's a few interesting things to think about here. One is that if this is in your opening hand, you can spend your turn one doing something else, and then play at turn two and underspend. Um, so if, for instance, you have a one drop, you have the uh, the choose one uh, discover, which is our next card, I guess. Um, 
you know, it, you can you can do these things, not necessarily just play the quest turn one because it doesn't really care until turn two unless you're spending the coin on turn one. But there's just a ton of cards that this is very powerful with. And there's a lot of, of choose one cards that, you know, obviously one half of them are, are okay. Uh, for instance, Nourish. Nourish is the card that I think is like the most massively buffed with this, which is, you know, the fact that you get both effects of Nourish, the Fandral Nourish effect, which we saw, you know, you know years ago or whatever, uh, is just outrageously powerful. Getting the, the card draw, getting the ramp, getting the immediate mana to use. It, this this really makes a lot of cards like Starfall you know, a lot more exciting. And uh, I, I really think that this is, uh, you know, just uh, obviously a deck into itself. And I think there's enough choose one cards to make this sufficiently powerful to really justify playing as a competitive deck. Um, and then in particular, the fact that there are, um, you know, cards that obviously are, are like directly uh, intended to support this, like the Choose One Discover, which we'll get to right now. Ta-da! Worthy Expedition, Discover a Choose One card. So obviously, you know, if you just sort of naturally had to have just all the Choose One cards you put into your deck with the uh, untapped potential Assyrian tier, might not have enough, and you might not you know, necessarily want the ones that you have at a given time. This, with a Discover Choose One card, outside of the context of the quest or playing like a singleton deck, I don't think is very exciting, but with the quest and the fact that this you know, gives you double, you know, essentially double uh, impact of all those cards, you get both halves of them, um, and also just gives you this you know, way to sort of weave in a, a, a mana's worth somewhere. You, know, you can play this on turn one, turn two, play the quest. You could play like, you know, the, the, this on like turn, you know, two, three, whatever, you play the quest early. This like, you know, like set up your turns to, to be able to actually get, so, you know, some of your value and still set up for your, your sort of power turns once you actually get the quest completed. There are, you know, a, just a lot of choose one cards, like the, uh, the uh, Oasis is obviously very powerful in the right circumstances. Being able to get multiple uh, scenarios in a game, scenarios in like Tending Torrin are both super powerful um, when you actually have both of the effects. Um, like I've I played uh, some of the games during the theory crafting streams where like my opponent played like scenarius and then flooped the scenarius and then played another scenarius because I got it from Worthy Expedition and you know this is just like absolutely massively powerful um, so having access to more of the big things that you can do uh, with the Assyrian tier with the Worthy Expedition is you know a huge part of its power you know uh, as well as getting sort of the utility of being able to find you know when you need a wrath when you need a starfall things like that so. Uh, I do think this is going to see play, obviously, in the, the Quest Druid deck, as well as possibly in the sort of Highlander-style deck. Outside of this, I, I'm, I'm much more doubtful, because, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of these sort of one-cost discover a thing have not really quite been at the power level you need, because they, they aren't necessarily all, like, super strong, the options. But Choose One is pretty much guaranteed to be a class card, which narrows the options. I don't think there are any Choose Ones that are not Druid cards. A, it narrows the options in terms of giving you more consistent choices, and B, class cards are more powerful, right? Like, if it's not, this isn't like Discover a Taunt, where, like, sometimes you just get Gold Your Footman, Shield Bearer, and, you know, some garbage card. This is guaranteed to give you something that has uh, has a pretty significant impact, or at least has, has pretty significant versatility to find, you know, the right opportunity for it. So, uh, I do think this card is pretty strong, and we'll see play in the right context. Next up, we have Hunter. And uh, first card for Hunter is Desert Spear. This is a three cost, one three weapon. After you attack, summon a one one locust with rush. So important things to note: the locust is a beast. So in a hunter deck, having uh, rushing beasts that you can continue to generate with the spear can be pretty powerful. You know, they can feed uh, your scavenging hyenas. They can be synergistic with you know any number of various beast things. Give you kill command stuff. Uh, it, it is you know, a single card that generates three uh, minions toward the Hunter quest, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, so I, I think this is you know, a card that kind of does a bunch of, of little things. Um, I don't feel like it is ultra powerful. Um, it, it feels like it is you know, kind of a, uh, a sort of role player type card. Uh, I can imagine you know, if there is a deck that really wants you know, like a lot of, of, uh, of beast generation, maybe a, again, Quest slash Revenge of the Wild deck. Desert Spear, I feel like, fits in there. I don't think this is a card that just fits into like the existing Master's Call type decks or like mid-range Hunter or anything like that. I think you really have to care about the fact that you're getting these 1-1 one, one Locusts with Rush um, to work towards some other end. I think that by itself, it doesn't really you know have high enough impact um, unless it is enabling something else. 
So uh, I don't think this is going to see a ton of play. If it does, it will be you know likely in those uh, those quest decks. But my gut instincts those are unlikely to be that powerful. Um, but uh, I, I do think that there's some promise there. Um, so we'll see. Next up is Dino Tamer Bran, who is just awesome. It's a seven cost two four battlecry. If your deck has no duplicate, summon King Crush. When we first saw this card, my initial instinct was like, ah, oh, it's probably not that good because I feel like trying to build like an aggressive, you know, hunter deck um, with singletons, where this card would obviously be at its best, um, would be very difficult. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not as sure that's the case. As the card pool expands, you know, obviously like there's more and more options that, you know, maybe you don't have the absolute most efficient thing, but there's good enough stuff um, as, you know, you get to like five sets in the pool, six sets in the pool, like right now and the you know, the, the last expansion of the year, um, where I do feel like those sort of singleton decks become more powerful because they have more, you know, uh, comparable options available at, at each mana cost where they're not really necessarily giving up quite as much. And obviously getting a, a seven cost eight, eight charge is pretty powerful to begin with. Um, my, my biggest criticism of this card is you don't get the King Crush animation when you play it. You just get the brand animation, and then there's no, like, boom, 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 where the giant dino comes in and flattens you. Um, so, other than that, I think this card is great. Uh, I really do like the uh, the fact that uh, this works uh, in... ends up working <laughs> a lot of times if you're playing, like, a Rafam deck, too, right? Uh, I've been playing Plots with Warlock and ended up getting like Reno and Bran off of her farm, and it's just like blow up all your guys and make a King Crush. Because once you get that low in your deck, pretty unlikely you end up with duplicate legendaries. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I am I'm always a fan of the Singleton style uh, style decks, and this is obviously a huge incentive to try Singleton Hunter, which I will definitely be doing. And uh, you know, obviously, this is you know, if the if that deck sees play, it's in large part because of this, because the power of getting. Uh, you know, a body plus a King Crush uh, for seven mana is, is pretty outrageous. So certainly enough to get me excited about trying the deck as far as like the power level of the deck itself. Again, unclear to me thus yet, uh, thus yet, thus far. Um, but uh, again, I do feel like those singleton decks do have a, a bit more power as the card pool expands simply because there are more comparable options for them to work with. So uh, I expect this to be you know, the superstar standout card if that deck is strong, uh, but I'm not convinced it will be yet. Next up we have Hunter's Pack. Uh, three cost spell, add a random Hunter Beast secret and weapon to your hand. And this card is okay. Uh, I saw some people comparing this, they're like, oh, it's like Master's Call, which it's not. Because, you know, there's a lot of, of relatively weak beasts, there's a lot of relatively weak secrets, and there's, you know, not that many weapons, but they're not necessarily great. This, I feel like, is a, you know, a card that, again, may see play in a singleton-style deck. Um, if you want to play a sort of mid-rangey, you know, controlling hunter deck um, that doesn't work with Master's Call, you know, say you want to play a brand deck, right? This is a, a reasonable way to generate value in a brand deck um, that can't play Master's Call because you play Brand. I mean, you could play Master's Call, but it's just a, a three mana discover effect rather than you know the power level of uh, of the card itself. So this this I think is a is a good way for decks that you know want to play non beast minions to still have some way to generate uh, generate some amount of value. Uh, I, I think this this could possibly be a decent card in like a Secret Hunter style of deck. Uh, obviously, getting a secret off of it you know it has uh, some impact. And then, you know, a number of the weapons in Hunter, or at least, you know, one of the weapons in Hunter, Eaglehorn Bow, works very well with the secrets. There aren't that many weapons in Hunter. I think there's like four total weapons, including this set, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, this is, is I, I doubt, like a superstar type card. Um, but if you are looking for just a little bit of extra resource generation in, again, Highlander style, maybe Secret Hunter, anything that can't Master's Call, or maybe, you know, once Master's Call rotates, this will be a, a bit more attractive to a wider range of Hunter decks. Uh, next up we have Hyena Alpha. Um, this card just seems bananas to me. This is Battlecry, if you control a secret, summon two, two, two hyenas. Remember Spellstone? Spellstone was five cost, make, you know, some three threes. This is like kind of like a Spellstone that you don't have, you have to have played a secret and had it not be killed and you get basically a four mana seven seven. Like this I think is one of the most powerful cards in the set. Is, is like my feeling. Um, obviously it's a board that's cleared by like Hellfire and stuff. Um, it, it, it's like a four mana thing that isn't cleared by a Dynomatic if you have you know a, uh, a secret in play obviously when you play it. 
Um, it, it is a beast, so that, I mean, this can go into a secret Master's Call deck if you really want to. Uh, I just think this is this feels like it's just one of the most efficient and and you know potent cards in the entire expansion. Um, it just gives you like so many stats for what it is. Granted, of course, you know you have to have a secret, and a lot of hunter secrets are like fairly easy for people to to kill. But think about it, like say you're playing this and you just have like Rat Trap, right? You, know, you, you play Rat Trap and it's like okay, well they either have to give you a six six or they have to leave your 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 trap up for Hyena Alpha in order to, to, to uh, you know, give you these, you know, big uh, swing turn on the board. And if they, the, the best way for a lot of decks to kill a Hyena Alpha is something like, you know, okay, I'm going to Warpath this. It's like, all right, well, you triggered my Rat Trap, and now here's a Rat instead. So I, I just think this card is extremely powerful, and uh, I expect it to be a, a centerpiece of uh, the Secret Hunter decks moving forward. And I expect those decks to be a much, much stronger thanks to the pressure that this lets them generate. I hope they can sing too. I wanna to hear the Hyena Alphas with some like Lion King songs. We need like backup vocals. I can't actually sing. But if I could, I might do a rendition of like Be Prepared right now. I don't, I'm not really, I don't really know the lyrics to Be Prepared very well. And it's not really appropriate to, to sing like I'm gonna be a Mighty King with the Hyena Alpha. I guess you actually really wanna play a deck with Hyena Alpha and Hymane. So you have like Scar and then is his like, you know, his little flunkies. It should be like an, uh, 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 an outtakes version of this review where I'd actually sing, but I'm not gonna do it. You're just gonna have to imagine that I did. I'm gonna be a mighty king, so enemies beware. Well, I've never seen a king of beasts with quite so little hair. Much better at Zazu. Next up we have Pressure Plate. It's a two cost secret, obviously, in Hunter. Um, after your opponent casts a spell, destroy a random enemy minion. Um, so this is obviously like just deadly shot when your opponent plays a spell. Uh, weird card in a lot of a lot of cases can be a decent way to uh, try and keep pressure played up against low minion decks. But overall, this feels like medium to me. Obviously, like if you want if you want a deadly shot effect, you have deadly shot. This, if you care about secrets, if you're like you know playing a, a deck that has secret synergies like Hyena Alpha, can be you know a, a, a possible uh, replacement for deadly shot. Uh, but overall, like, your opponent having control over when this triggers, or at least having the ability to check control over when this triggers, is uh, is definitely uh, pretty interesting. It's It doesn't even, like, deal with, like, like Conjurer's Calling that well. Because these people will be like, oh, this, like, stops your opponent from Conjurer's Calling. It's like, well, it's after they cast it, so they cast their Conjurer's Calling, they have two giants, and then they have one giant. So you killed a giant. And that's assuming they didn't, like, also have, like, mirror images for you to, like, you know like possibly soak up with this. Whereas if we just had a deadly shot and they play a giant, you're like, okay, deadly shot it. Instead of like pressure plate, I really hope you play a spell before your giant attacks or does anything. There, there is a little bit of interesting, uh, you know, sort of dichotomy in terms of like how your opponent wants to approach this, right? Like if you, if you have a trap down, a lot of times it's like, okay, I'm gonna test for this, I'm gonna test for this. And like, this does make the, the testing for trap process awkward, right? Because, you know, it's, it's not, it, it's something that has like a very high impact, uh, resolution and you know isn't like easy to test for in a, in a way that isn't dangerous to you you'd have to like you know play a small minion then play a spell in order for this to like you know to for you to trigger this well but yeah you know, my my gut is that this isn't like super exciting but it does make secret testing more difficult and it is like a tool that those sort of decks that are looking to play a secret package maybe with uh, you know the uh, the hyena and stuff like subject nine give them you know a, a way to uh, make life more difficult for your opponents. Next up we have Ram Ram Kahan Ram Kahan Ram Kahan Rastakhan no Ram Kahan Wild Tamer a three cost four three battle cry copy a random beast in your hand. I actually had not seen this card before right now, and uh, so I haven't really formulated a, a significant thought process about it, but this card seems like it has a lot of, of possibilities. You know, you could play this in you know, a deck with King Crush, get extra King Crushes. You could play this in a deck with like Undasta, right? You know, like a big Druid deck, or big Druid, big Hunter deck, copy your like, you know, Undasta, copy your other big thing to put in play after your Undasta, whatever. Um, you could copy your Hyena Alpha play your Hyena Alpha into another Hyena Alpha. Um, so there's, there's just like so many things, right? There's not really like a lot of hand buffing stuff going on in, in Hunter right now. There is the, uh, the the Beast will get you shortly, which reduces the cost of the Beast in your hand. So if you reduce the cost of something, maybe you then copy it with this. You know, you can copy things that have been buffed by Dire Frenzy. There's a lot of, of ways that this can get more value than just like, oh, I'm copying like, you know, a random thing. 
and it's a 4 3 for 3 which is fine you know these are, aren't like amazing stats but they, they're you know better than uh, sort of vanilla average with a pretty powerful uh, additional effect so you know I, I you know I can't go to a master's call deck which is obviously a pretty huge drawback right now in terms of the power level of you know a deck that wants to play a lot of those things we've been talking about right if a deck wants to play dire frenzy there's a good chance they want to play master's call which is much harder if you're playing the the wild tamer here so my my gut is that this probably won't see a lot of play while Master's Call is still around, simply because the the you know the decks that are looking to do that would probably rather use use Master's Call to get their sort of incremental advantages. Um, but once Master's Call rotates, I could see this as being pretty powerful. And you know maybe there is like again sort of like a brand sort of Highlander style deck that can't play Master's Call, um, which does want to make use of this. So I think this is. Yeah, probably like an, an average-ish card, unlikely to really be like knocking the door down of uh, of competitive uh, uh, constructed, uh, but does have some possible future applications as well as sort of more narrow applications than Highlander decks. Next up, we have Scarlet Web Weaver. Speaking of the the uh, reduced cost beast, uh, this card I think is is super cool. You know, Battle Cry reduced the cost of a random beast in your hand by five. This can obviously give you you know discount King Crush, discount like High Main, discount whatever. Um, allow you to, you know, have the like big turns like King Crush into Faceless or whatever, or, you know, just have like a big tempo turn uh, into, you know, like after your opponent's big removal spell or whatever else. I, I think this card is just like has a ton of, of like interesting applications. Uh, it is a beast, so you can still play it in your Master's Call deck, which, you know, as I was mentioning before, really big deal in terms of trying to evaluate the power level of, of a lot of Hunter stuff right now, because that card is just so good. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think that this you know, is not necessarily something that just kind of like slots into a deck, right? This isn't like, um, just like, oh, this is like a super efficient thing that any any deck that plays, you know, uh, like Beasts wants. I think that you want to have a generally a specific plan if you're playing this, um, in particular, because it, it does cost six, right? So the fact that it costs six for a five, five, it's like pretty medium. Um, but like, there's a lot of things that this can combine with in in like really powerful ways. Like Tundra Rhino, for instance, you get a zero cost Tundra Rhino, and like the world is your oyster. You just blow people up so incredibly powerfully. Um, you do need to sort of plan around how you want to play this. You're obviously not going to just play this when you have a bunch of like like spring paws or whatever in your hand. Um, but it, it does like sort of create all of these pretty powerful dramatic turns that you're able to have, uh, which aren't possible otherwise. So uh, my 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 guess is that this is, you know, like a uh, sort of a, a uh, fairly niche card. It's not going to show up in like every sort of Master's Call Hunter deck. Um, but if there's like a metagame where you're really trying to build toward, you know, like the uh, the Tundra Rhino OTK, say there's like really powerful control decks that don't build up a lot of armor or something similar to that, um, where you're, you know, really looking to burst kill people, I can definitely see it having, uh, having home there. Next up is Swarm of Locusts, which is a pretty hilarious card. Uh, six cost spell, summon seven, one, one locust with rush. So uh, this has obvious synergies with the quest, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, also works really well if you happen to have scavenging hyena. I imagine like just having like uh, the, the previous card that we, we just saw, the, uh, the spider, reducing the cost of your tundra rhino, then playing scavenging hyena, playing this, attacking all of these into something, and then playing your tundra rhino and killing your opponent with the scavenging hyena. Boom, dead. There's obviously like a ton of things in uh, in Hunter that uh, you can you know synergize with this. Um, lots of things that care about beasts dying. Lots of things that just care about like things attacking. You can use this with like with like uh, Revenge of the Wild. Keep bringing them back, killing more things. Um, it, it is uh, it is not particularly good with Zuljin. <laughs> Zuljin uh, decks typically want to you know build out a wide board of. Uh, you know, a bunch of uh, Unleash the Beasts and such, and this is not particularly good there. But, you know, if you are playing a deck that's looking to, to build on sort of beast synergies, beast dying synergies, whether it's, uh, or beast summon synergies, whether it's like, you know, Revenge of the Wild or uh, Cult Master or Scavenging Hyena, um, this has a lot of things that it's doing for you. I think the most likely application of this, though, um, is that it ends up being a Quest Hunter card because it's a single card that generates seven minions um, and obviously is also powerful after the resolution of your quest because you can make seven uh, three power locusts with rush to clear things off. So uh, maybe this, you know, I think you're gonna be hearing me say this a lot for, uh, for some of these cards. 
uh, you know, maybe this goes into a specific build, very specific build like Quest Hunter. Maybe this ends up being sort of a utility card in a, uh, a single zone hunter deck that's looking to like have, you know, the ability to play board control and cares about the possible death synergies and, and beast synergies as well. So uh, I think it's kind of a, a, a middling card um, with specific applications. All right, next up we have Unseal the Vault, the, uh, the Hunter Quest. With, uh, the quest is summon 20 minions, and the reward is... Dun, 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 dun. Oh god, it's too big! Why'd it, why'd it get huge? <sighs> okay, well, that, there it is. <laughs> he was roaring really loudly. That's why he was just huge. Uh, Ram Kahen's Roar. Um, so, this, this is a pretty powerful effect, turning your hero power into give your minions plus two attack, and his plus two attack permanently, by the way, permanently. This isn't Savage Roar. Your minions have plus two attack this turn. This is permanent. Though my guess is that most decks playing this are uh, not really gonna need that permanent buff very often because they're very, you know, very frequently just gonna kill your opponent when you get like you know, a roar or two off with a big board of minions. So this quest, summon 20 minions. Crucially, this is not play 20 minions. This isn't like the old hunter quest. Um, which wanted you to, you know, play one drop, so you have to play a bunch of one drops from your hand, and it was also super awkward because it cost your one mana play in order to do so. Um, so this obviously works very well with anything that like multi summons, like Swarm of Locusts, um, things like Spring Paw, which are two cards, you know, two minions for one card. Uh, works with Unleash the Hounds. Overall, you know, I, I think that this feels like a pretty difficult quest to complete in a reasonable time frame, and also, you know, get to the point where like this uh, ability is still really relevant. Overall, I, I think this is, you know, most likely, you know, going to see play if the meta game is such that stuff like Unleash and Swarm of Locusts are powerful. Uh, if the meta game is such that like there's, you know, zoo decks, right, where Unleash is an amazing card. Um, you, you can play like this, plus Unleash, plus like uh, Revenge of the Wild, and like, you know, kill your opponent's stuff, put tons of progress in your quest, kill more of your opponent's stuff, and then like, you know, Unleash and like kill them, right? Um, and overall though, I, I feel like, you know, you're probably gonna have, if you build your deck in this way, right, your deck is full of a bunch of Swarm of Locusts, you're full of a bunch of Unleashes and Revenge of the Wilds, against like proactive decks where those cards are not that powerful, specifically Unleash, um, it's you know, much harder to, to sort of make progress toward this quest uh, if your unleashes aren't doing very much because it's like a, a control slash, you know, very likely single minion type uh, uh, of, of format. Doesn't feel like you're going you're gonna to get very far with this. Um, so my, my general feeling is that this quest does not seem like it's particularly strong. Uh, it definitely can do some crazy things. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I will try to build it and others will as well. Um, but it's not one of the, the, the cards that really stands out uh, as like one of the really powerful quests. I feel like this is kind of feels more like one of the old quests um, from Angoro in terms of like, you know, it is much more difficult to complete, or at least it seems like it's going to take a much longer time to complete than uh, many of the other ones. Like, obviously, the Druid quest, you can literally just have it completed turn four, you know, with the coin. It's just like, okay, it's completed. Now I just, you know, do my thing. This is going to take a lot more work, and especially. If you are relying again on stuff like Unleash, depends on what your opponent does and their ability to constrain your quest progress and even the power of, of once your quest is completed, right? Like if if you can't unleash for a bunch and then roar them and go to your opponent's face, it ends up being a lot weaker than it otherwise would be. So not super impressed by this one, um, but would not be totally surprised to see it show up in competitive play. And our last hunter card is Wild Bloodstinger. This is a uh, a nicely statted minion, uh, six cost six nine. It's a beast. Uh, battle cry: Summon a minion from your opponent's hand. Attack it. Um, I, I think this card is super cool. Um, this is kind of like the uh, the spider thing that I, you know. I was like, ah, I don't know, like it, you know, what where this goes exactly, but it's like a cool option for like a mid range style hunter deck to have to like be able to disrupt combo type decks. One of the biggest problems that like a lot of mid-range style hunter decks will often have is like their deck is good if your if your your deck is doing a certain type sort of thing they're good at like fighting for the board or they're good at like beating control but they they're not fast enough to beat combo type decks right when you, you know assuming you're mid-range not like a really aggressive hunter deck um, this gives you you know a way it's like okay well if, if you're playing like a you know Malagos deck you're playing you know a like Floop whatever deck you're playing you know 
some sort of uh, of of deck that relies on a minion based combo, this can be a, a great way to disrupt it. It's it's kind of like a dirty rat, right? But it's a it's a big dirty rat. Uh, it's a dirty scorpion, um, and you know the the fact that it's a beast is pretty key for a lot of things. One, you know, obviously you can go in deck with Master's Call. Um, works well with you know all the various beast synergies that do exist, but also just you know it, it is a uh, it, it's big enough that like you know you put it out there. A lot of times you're just gonna like with like a dirty rat, you're putting put out like a mid range type thing. You're like oh well that that kind of sucks. This is like no, I, you put a mid range thing and just eat it. There's obviously some things that can be that can go really bad for you, right? Like if your opponent has like a mechano egg, your blood stinger like stings the egg. It's like dude. Hold on, let's 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 not let's not fight that thing, you know. Or if there's just like you know small poisonous minions that for whatever reason are popular, that kind of sucks. Um, but even just be able to like eat like a Omega Devastator against Warrior, being able to kill you know like Elysiana, right? Like getting your opponent's Elysiana out like is hugely disruptive. You can just win a fatigue game against a, you know a Warrior deck if you're not like uh, tracking too much and you Bloodstinger their Elysiana. Um, you know, even like control, the fact that a lot of the, the control tools do come from, again, uh, Omega Devastator, Dynomatic, you know, gives you this disruptive potential, even against decks that are not like purely, uh, combo oriented. So I think this is a very cool card. Um, it's the sort of card that I love having access to, cause I love playing mid range style decks that don't necessarily kill your opponent really quickly and hate just losing to combos. So the fact that there's this disruption available, I think is very cool. And I expect this card not to be like a, you know, ultra popular card, but, uh, to see like a good amount of like tech style play. Next up we have Mage. First up, Arcane Flak Mage. It's a two cost three, two after you play a secret deal two damage to all enemy minions. So frequently, um, ever since Flame Waker, uh, went the way of, uh, of Wild, uh, a lot of sort of uh, aggressive secret based decks that mages had have typically struggled at dealing with uh, opposing aggressive decks, specifically uh, you know, opposing swarm style decks because you know, they would just sort of fall behind and not really be able to keep up. Arcane Flak Mage is very powerful in those style of matchups. It's a 3-2 two for 2, which means it's a totally reasonable uh, tempo play against you know, controlling decks or whatever, ramp style decks, combo decks to just keep getting your aggro on. And uh, you know, against the uh, the other minion-based decks, you can sort of sandbag this at least a little bit, and you know, play it alongside a secret. Uh, it's very good with the uh, the uh, find a secret from your deck, draw a secret from your deck. It costs zero. Uh, you know, the ability to set it up and ensure that you can play at least one, possibly even two secrets in the same turn to wipe out your opponent's stuff. Uh, yeah, I think this is you know, definitely just a solid card. Uh, the, this, there's a lot of secret mage support in this set. Uh, right now, secret mage isn't really a deck, so I do feel like uh, it needs a bit of uh, uh, a bit of hefty support. Um, in particular, since Mana Worm got nerfed to two mana, uh, it's been difficult for a lot of these uh, these sort of more aggressive mage decks uh, to really sort of find their footing. Uh, this is kind of a, not really a, an aggressive card purely, though, is a thing. And one of the things that, that Mana Worm did was allow you to sort of get ahead on tempo. This allows you to at least catch up in tempo, uh, which is a very, very important factor, again, against those aggressive decks. So uh, I, I do feel like this has uh, some, some pretty strong potential uh, if Secret Mage does end up finding its footing uh, in order to, uh, to give you uh, a... Uh, uh, a way to sort of get back into those matchups that are typically pretty bad for you. Speaking of secret cards, Ancient Mysteries, this is exactly what I was talking about, draw a secret from your deck, it costs zero. Um, we've had a lot of cards that support Secret Mage in the past, like Arcanologist was probably the strongest of them, uh, outside of like Mad Scientist. This is kind of like a Mad Scientist that, uh, that immediately died. <laughs> you don't get the Mad Scientist body, but you do get to play your secret immediately on turn two if you want. Um, you can also, uh, crucially, draw your secret and then wait and play it in the same turn as uh, something like the uh, the Flak Mage you're looking to use uh, it in synergy with. You know, if you have uh, the, uh, what is it, Cloud Prince or whatever it is, the, uh, you know, upcoming card that we're going to talk about, uh, anything that cares about having a secret in play, uh, you can ensure that you're able to, to line those up together and your opponent doesn't have an opportunity to break your secret. Uh, prior to you getting that synergistic effect because you can play the this, this secret for zero. And this allows you to play like a smaller number of secrets in your deck and still have a reasonable access to those secrets throughout the game. One of the weird things if you are playing Secret Mage, like playing a bunch of copies of your secrets can be pretty awkward because you end up with a, a you know, handful of, of these secrets which are you know, in themselves not necessarily that efficient. 
Um, but being able to play like you know, a slightly smaller number of secrets and then Ancient Mysteries to find them allows you to thin out your deck, find your other stuff as well, uh, as well as try and set up those uh, those sort of secret synergies together. So I, I do feel like this is a you know a pretty uh, a pretty strong card. Uh, can go into you know a, a variety of decks. Maybe you just play this in you know any deck that has those secret synergy things. Maybe you play it because you're you're trying to play like a a singleton mage deck, right? You play like Reno Mage, and you want to have more access to Ice Barrier, for instance. You play this plus Ice Player plus like Flame Ward. You know you you have a, a just array of defensive secrets, and you want to have more access to them. Um, it, it's also a way to cast multiple spells for relatively cheap. You pay two mana and, and draw a secret that can play the secret for zero. Works well with the, the spell-based decks, whether they're mana cyclone-style stuff or the new, like, Dune Shifter or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's lots of, of, of sort of pieces that this pulls together that I think uh, makes it likely that it's not, not going to be, like, a superstar card, but uh, quite possibly a role player in a variety of different decks. I just keep, you know, sort of spoiling the cards I'm going to talk about in the previous cards. Uh, this Cloud Prince, I was right about the name. 5 cost, 4-4 four, four, Elemental. Battlecry, if you control a secret, deal 6 damage. So first of all, 6 is a lot of damage, right? This is a 4-4 four, four body with a Fireball attached for only one more mana than Fireball. Obviously, you know, the, the fact that you have to control a secret does mean that it's a bit less reliable, but with, you know, uh, the, uh, the Arcane Mysteries that we just saw, as well as just playing secrets in your deck, you know, this can be just extremely powerful. Um, you know, if you just look at, like, you play this, you play some fireballs, that's, like, almost enough damage to just kill your opponent by itself. Uh, if you're just, like, looking to burn people out, you know, very strong tempo option, very strong burn option. Um, and, and again, the fact that, that you can use the Arcane Mysteries to get a zero-cost secret that you can then wait and play alongside your Cloud Prince, either on turn five or, like, turn four with the coin, um, makes it that much more likely that you can effectively get uh, your secret online uh, in order to to manifest that synergy. Um, the there's also just like you know a number of secrets that aren't necessarily super likely to just be broken, right? You, you know, in certain matchups like Splitting Image is you know something that your opponent is not likely to to, to break. Maybe you have Spellbender and you're like, okay, I'm gonna you know like play like a, a variety of these secrets to try and ensure that it's difficult for my opponent to to break them, so that I'm more likely to be able to get Cloud Prince online. So um, I think it's a very powerful card. Again, like the, you know, is this enough? This plus the uh, the Flak Mage plus the Arcane Mysteries to really turn Secret Mage into a thing? Not clear, um, but they they are definitely, uh, are definitely like very heavily pushing Secret Mage with, with these cards. Um, and, you know, I think that, that there's at least, you know, a shell there that looks exciting to try. Um, and, you know, this is certainly, uh, I think the, Probably the, the the most powerful of the uh, these sort of uh, payoff cards. This is basically a, a really big Medivh's valet. Medivh's valet was very good. This is, in a couple of you know, a couple of senses, like not quite as good as Medivh's valet. Like the fact that it costs five makes it much harder to to play in the same turn as a secret if you don't have the arcane mysteries to discount it. And and also you know the uh, sort of ability to get this damage online faster. Like a small a small amount of damage online earlier for board control purposes is generally better. Um, but, you know, this just, you know, doesn't need that much more help to just burn your opponent into the ground. All right, next up we have Dune Sculptor. After you cast a spell, add a random mage minion into your hand. This is one of my favorite of the new mage cards. This is, like, not one of the cards I think has gotten, like, a ton of hype. But this is one of my favorite cards uh, from the set. And the reason is that there's a lot of, sort of, spell-heavy mage decks that in certain matchups, mostly against Control, specifically, like, against Control Warrior, Kind of run out of gas, right? And, you know, like, you, you're playing your deck that has, like, Ray of Frost and Magic Trick and all this. And, like, right now, if you're playing you know, a lot of decks, like, built in that way, in some matchups, you're basically on Antonitis or Bust. If you're not playing, like, the Conjurer's Calling Mountain Giant style of deck, which, you know, is obviously extremely powerful, but we're talking about, like, a different direction of sort of these, these heavily spell-based mage decks. This, I think, you know, is a way to gain a lot of extra value out of a lot of those spells that may just be sort of sitting in your hand for a while. And it gives a, a random mage minion. Mage minions, there's not a ton of them. Obviously there's more now um, with the set and you know, the fact that there's like Cloud Prince and this itself and you know the, the Flak Mage and whatnot. But there's a lot of very powerful mage minions. Um, there's like Calicos, there's Hexlord Malacras. Even like a long game like Janelai, you know, can end up being extremely powerful. 
So this is, you know, not a, a you know a, a card that that goes into I think like the Conjure Mage type decks because those already have this like powerful long game plan. But you know, even just having one of these in like you know a uh, sort of more tempo mage style of deck can give you this really powerful long game plan at a pretty low cost. You know, you you can generate like a you know a bunch of uh, minions in a turn, and you're like, okay, well I got like a Messenger Raven, which gets me a Calicos, which you know I got like a Hexler Malacras, which gives me my Dune Sculptor back, and I can just go off. Um, so I, I don't think this is like crazy powerful, um, but I do think that it, it is a card that gives like a new dimension to a particular type of deck that could struggle with running out of gas against decks that, that had like a lot of a uh, lot of life gain, a lot of armor gain, a lot of removal. Um, and for that reason, I think it's I think it's really sweet, and I'm really looking forward to playing with it. All right, next up we have Flame Ward. Uh, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, talking about uh, some of the uh, the secrets that are in the format now. Flame Ward, after a minion attacks your hero, deal three damage to all enemy minions. It's a little bit weird because it, it looks on the surface you're like, oh, this is explosive trap, but it's not quite explosive trap because it doesn't actually kill the thing that attacks you first, because it gets to hit your your hero first. So this, I think, is, is a, a, you know, a pretty interesting card as far as uh, sort of creating a pool of secrets that your opponent needs to figure out how to, like, play around. Um, it's also, you know, a, another solid defensive secret. Uh, the fact that this is, you know, a an, an AoE for three that costs three mana, uh, you know, for, like, a controlling style deck is a really big deal. Um, you know, great against like any kind of aggressive style deck, great against um, token decks in the mid to late game. Um, obviously, again, does not save you from like a Leroy coming down and hitting you in the face late game. Um, doesn't save you from, you know, a giant minion or anything like that. But uh, I think is, you know, much like the pressure plate, a, a card that, that gives, you know, that much more pause to your opponent when they're trying to figure out exactly how to play around the secrets you might have, you know, is also just, you know, a, a powerful tool if you're, you know, looking to play a, a controlling mage deck and, uh, you know, you, you want to have some sort of, like, early game defense against aggressive decks. That's where a lot of, a lot of mage decks is like, okay, they've really come online once they can start casting, like, Blizzard and Flame Strike and such, but until then, they're, you know, they're in a, in a rough spot, but, but this three damage clears out you know, it clears out Blink Foxes, it clears out Lackeys, it clears out Spirit of the Shark. So you know, it's, it's a very, very good number for actually hitting and popping, uh, you know, a lot of boards that can otherwise be a real problem. So I think this is a very strong card. It's really good in, in control against aggro. It's not good, I don't think, in like the aggro uh, sort of secret mage style that seems to be supported in the set. But even just like, you know, in like Reno Mage, right? Being able to play like the Arcane Mysteries plus Ice Barrier plus this, as I mentioned before, you know, sort of as a, a defensive secret package, maybe one more, I don't know, really gives you uh, a lot of sort of flexibility and survivability uh, that I think is really, really valuable. All right, next up we have Naga Sandwich, which, <laughs> like, I, was this an intentional pun? I mean, because obviously there was Naga Sea Witch. Now this is Naga Sandwich. So like they serve Naga sandwiches as at like you know a cafe in in Azeroth somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> like the the people who work on Hearthstone are people who appreciate puns. I like I haven't seen the flavor text for this, but it's gotta somehow relate to to being a sandwich. Anyway, five cost five five battle cry change the cost of spells in your hand to five. Obviously not as sort of abusive for generating boards proactively as the other, you know, the Naga Sea Witch was that, you know, made all your stuff cost five. But uh, I, I do think this is, you know, a kind of an interesting card, like more like, okay, do you play like big spell mage and just do like wacky things with this? Um, I, I don't really know where this goes. It, is, it has like a lot of, a lot of possible like long-term power, right? Like you can play a deck that has like this and like a bunch of huge spells. Maybe you're playing this with like Pyroblasts and... You know, uh, you're playing it with the uh, Puzzle Box of Yogg Saron. You're playing with Flame Strikes and things like that. It, it's not a legendary, so you can play two of them. A lot of sort of build aroundish cards like this end up being legendaries. But the fact that this is a two of that you can play, you know, you can more reliably try and actually build like a deck that can try and double Pyroblast someone when they get to ten mana. I doubt that is going to be a a like high level competitive deck, um, but it's it's cool to uh, cool to think about. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I I'm sure that we'll see people trying to do crazy stuff with it. You can play like this with like, what is it? There's the, there's a discover a spell in your deck, you know, cast it card with random targets and ju just play a bunch of big spells. And, uh, you know, I'm curious to try that kind of like a spiteful summoner style deck that really leans on, uh, leans on sandwich, leans on the, uh, the Tortolan, uh, 
I don't know, Tertullian Yogg-Saron is basically what it'll end up being, but I, uh, I'm definitely going to try building that deck because it seems sweet. Again, I doubt it'll be good, but it'll be worth it. Speaking of, Puzzle Box of Yogg-Saron, 10 cost spell, cast 10 random spells, target chosen randomly. I love it. Like, you know, I'm going to play this so much, and I'm also going to play it, and every time I'm going to, you know, pull a, a 7, you know, what's in the box? What's in the box? And it's going to be great, and it will never get old. The one thing that makes me sad about this is that apparently it can't cast itself. It is not actually 10 random spells. It is 10 random spells that are not also Puzzle Box of Yogg-Saron. Um, which, you know, I get that you're like, okay, we don't want this to, to possibly go on forever, but like the chances of that is like so low. And just let me live the dream, man. Let me, let me live the dream of Puzzle Box into Puzzle Box into Puzzle Box into Puzzle Box into Puzzle Box. That's all I want. That's all I want out of life at this point. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't think this is a good card. I don't think this is like a, a card that you're like, you know what, I'm playing a, a top competitive deck. Like a lot of people are like, oh, this is like Yogg, and Yogg was so powerful. Yogg, Yogg was like the best bad option for a lot of decks, right? Like the, the decks that used Yogg were basically Druid ramp decks before the existence of Spreading Plague. And they're like, we can't deal with big boards of anything. So the only thing we can really do is play Yogg. And, you know, Yogg like, was better than not having Yogg, but it was not that good. And this is, like, in, in Mage, where, A, you don't have Ramp, like those old decks did, where you could just, you know, Yogg early if you really needed to against an aggressive deck. And B, you have a bunch of other, like, powerful board control type options, so your best bet is less likely to be, oh, I'm just going to try and do something randomly. Uh, I don't know. I, I think this is this is definitely going to be a, a hilarious card, a meme card, a YouTube highlight card, but I do not think it's a competitive card, though I will still try it. We will get to number one legend with Puzzle Box of Yogg Saron. Believe it. No, we won't. All right, next up we have Raid the Sky Temple, the mage quest. Uh, the quest is cast 10 spells. The reward is Ascendant Scroll, which is pay two mana, add a random mage spell to your hand. It costs two less. Much like with the uh, the Dune Fellow that I was talking about, this is you know an interesting card to give you staying power to a spell-heavy deck. If you're playing a deck that, like, you know, has, again, a bunch of magic tricks, a bunch of Ray of Frost, a bunch of unexpected results, whatever, this is a cool card to give you this, like, long game staying power, so you're, you're not just, like, hero powering, you know, the, the warrior deck or whatever uh, once you actually get to the, the, the end of the game. Um, I, I do think this is, a, this is a card that a lot of people will be like, ooh, I'll just put this into whatever deck. I have a bunch of spells. And I think it's generally going to be a mistake. The, you know, one of the most important things to, to keep in mind when, whenever you're playing a quest deck is that quests cost you a card from your hand. It's not just like something that you can, uh, you know, get to at a later stage of the game. You're like, I'm playing a bunch of spells. Like, well, it's going to be harder to play 10 spells in a game if one of the cards you draw every single game is is Raid the Sky Temple. So I, I don't think this is just like a card you put into a mage deck, which a lot of people are like, oh, you just play this in Conjurer Mage because you already have Mana Cyclone and stuff. A, Conjurer Mage doesn't need this because they already have really powerful long-term game plans. And B... Conjurer Mage probably doesn't want to give up a card in its hand because that makes it harder to cast Mountain Giant. So I, I think this is more like, hey, you're playing a, you know, you're, you're playing like a, a really spell heavy, you know, kind of kind of like, you know, crazy synergistic whatever type of deck and you run out of gas. So this is one of the options you have to, you know, refuel with gas. Uh, I, I actually am not convinced that this is better than the, the, the Dune Shifter, Dune Sculptor guy because I think that the Dune Sculptor guy the fact that it doesn't cost you a card in your opening hand of every single game gives you, you know, it, it's like a huge plus. And, you know, it, it also gives you, like, you know, significant staying power that is not just more spells. So I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm less convinced after having seen the, the Dune Sculptor fellow um, that this is, you know, a, as powerful, as viable a sort of late game plan as that. Um, but uh, I'm definitely going to try it because it seems super fun. So my guess is that this is, this uh, card does not end up being like a, a tier one sort of competitive deck or in a tier one competitive deck, um, but I do expect it'll see a lot of experimental play because it certainly seems sweet. Next up we have Reno the Relicologist, which is it doesn't quite roll off the tongue in the same way as Reno Jackson. Um, I will not be cosplaying this version of Reno because I'm not nearly fancy enough. Um, also, like, it... it really kind of bothers me that he doesn't have his hat. I, I get that in the full image it's like being blown off his head or something, but I don't know. Anyway, um, so Reno the Relicologist, um, he is pretty sweet. Um, I, I've seen a lot of people say that they think this card is bad because it's not old Reno, but I think this card is extremely powerful. 
Like 10 damage to your opponent's board is gonna clear a lot of boards. Doesn't clear two giants, granted, um, or four giants, or eight giants, or whatever. Um, but it does clear a lot. And you know, like a, a six cost body that very likely clears your opponent's board and leaves a four six behind is, is like pretty powerful. I mean, if there, if there was just a six cost spell that were deal 10 damage randomly split among all enemy minions, that would be a strong card. And this is a 4-6 attached to that. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that this is necessarily enough to justify playing Singleton, because obviously there's, you know, lots of uh, powerful mage cards, powerful, you know, neutral cards that you, you, like, you know, want to play more of just one. But yeah, I, I think that this is definitely going to be one of the more powerful cards in the, uh, in the sort of Singleton mage decks. Obviously, you'd hope it is, because it's the reason to build Singleton, this and Zephyrus. But... I do really feel like it's been underrated from what I've seen most people discussing regarding uh, regarding Reno, and I think that it's going to be hugely impactful in lots of different matchups. Um, it, it doesn't just carry your entire deck, but it gives you a great way to, to come back into a game where you fall behind, which frankly is one of the things that singleton decks need, right? Like you're, you have a deck that has le less consistent removal opportunities uh, because you're not playing two copies of each of your removal spells, so having something like this that allows you to get back into that game once you do fall behind at that point is really, really valuable. So um, I expect that Reno Mage is one of the decks that I will play the most. Um, just I generally love the gameplay style of singleton decks because the games play out so differently. And, uh, you know, I uh, I love getting lucky and getting my key card like Reno to blow up all my opponent's stuff. Uh, I do think that if this, if it were just Reno that existed, I would be like less inclined to, uh, to you know, really build like a Highlander type deck you know, for Mage. Um, but the fact that this exists alongside Zephyrus, which of course we will get to in the neutral section, which is one of the coolest cards that's ever existed in Hearthstone, I, I think that, that that is enough to sort of push it over the edge to the point that it's like, ooh, well, both of these make this really exciting and I'm going to try it. And last, but certainly not least in Mage, we have Tortolan Pilgrim. This is a fellow I was talking about before, 8 cost 5, 5, battle cry, discover a copy of a spell in your deck and cast it with random targets. Um, so yeah, I, I, this plus the, the the Naga Sandwich in a deck with just a bunch of like pyroplasts and puzzle boxes and flame strikes seems hilarious to me. Seems great. By great, I don't mean good, but by great, I mean awesome and fun to play with. Um, I mean, I, there are a lot of things that you could have in your deck that make this just consistently gonna be very powerful, right? Like if your deck is pretty much all like untargeted AOE, like flame strikes and blizzards, frost nova card draw, like Arcane Intellect, you know, maybe Puzzle Box or whatever. Um, just a lot of things that like are always going to be good no matter what the sort of random target is. Um, this, you know, is just a 5-5 that's attached to discover and, and play a spell. And you know, that's pretty strong, right? Granted, you're, you're like, you know, not going to only play those, but the fact that it's a discover effect, it's not just a random spell, means that it's unlikely that, you know, you're, you're going to hit an array of stuff. It's like, ooh, you know, none of these are good. Or like, I gotta, I gotta take the risk and like, you know, Frostbolt or Fireball myself, you know, it's not really how this is gonna work. Um, so you, you've extremely likely, you know, if you if you build your deck in a particular way to get this, uh, to have like a really, really high impact effect whenever you play it. Granted, you know, again, it's an eight cost five five. So, you know, you're, it's not like gonna be something that's like a massive, massive game swing, even if you, you do hit like, you know, Flame Strike or whatever, an eight, an eight drop, eight cost five five with a Flame Strike attached is powerful, but not like, Oh my God, this is unbelievably game breaking necessarily. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely sweet and definitely gonna be a card that uh, I do put into decks with Puzzle Box of Yogg-Saron to just make sure I cast it as many times as I can.